Well, good uh, morning, everybody. Uh, very good to see you all. Uh, I'm Norman Lamb, the Minister for Care and Support. Uh, and the uh, Lib Dems health uh, spokesperson in this campaign. Uh, today we're launching a Manifesto for the Mind. This is our uh, commitment to achieve uh, genuine equality uh, for those suffering uh, from mental ill health. Uh, it involves an additional investment over the next parliament of some £3.5 billion uh, in mental health, both children's mental health and adults' mental health. We're able to do this because of our uh, continuing uh, total commitment uh, to the NHS and the fact that we've been willing to uh, commit to the additional resources that are necessary that Simon Stevens uh, has identified. I think it's fair to say that we've achieved an awful lot in this parliament in terms of uh, mental health. Uh, we've seen a massive expansion of the number of people uh, getting access to psychological therapies. It will hit about 900,000 this year, up from 300,000 in 2010. We've seen a dramatic reduction in the number of people who end up in police cells as a result of a mental health crisis. And we're also introducing a world-leading uh, liaison and diversion service to divert people away from the criminal justice system uh, as a result of uh, mental ill health. But we want to go much further than that. We want to achieve genuine equality, not rhetoric, genuine equality for those suffering uh, from mental ill health. Uh, we made our commitment back in February, uh, back in October, sorry, to introduce the first ever access and waiting time standards in mental health, something that people with physical health problems have enjoyed for many years, uh, not enjoyed by those with men mental health problems. They come into effect in April this year but we intend to roll that out across uh, mental health so that everyone uh, who suffers from mental ill health has a right to access treatment uh, on a timely basis. And when I talked recently to Mike Richards, who was the cancer czar in the last parliament and who introduced standards in cancer care, he said we have the opportunity now to achieve the same revolution in mental health care as we did in cancer care in the last decade. We have that within our grasp but it's this party that is leading the case uh, for that investment and for that commitment to equality. So on that, uh, I'm delighted to introduce uh, party leader, Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg. Thank you, Norman, and thank you all for being here so uh, bright and early. The uh, dividing lines of this election are becoming clearer by the day. The Conservatives will cut too much and Labour will borrow too much. Excessive cuts or excessive borrowing. It's a dismal choice. What you want is a balanced budget and strong public services. And that's what the Liberal Democrats offer. Only the Liberal Democrats have a credible plan to finish the job of balancing the books and investing in our public services. It's a plan that maintains the steady centre ground approach we've pursued in government that the Conservatives now want to leave behind. And it is a plan that means we can commit to giving the NHS the money that it needs, an extra £8 billion by 2020. That is how much Simon Stevens, the head of NHS England, has asked for. Our commitment also means at least £800 million more for the health service in Scotland and £450 million for Wales by 2020. Labour hasn't committed to it. The Conservatives try to give the impression that they have but they haven't. This weekend, Jeremy Hunt said they would find the money, but he didn't say how much, and he didn't say who would pay. We know the Conservatives won't ask the wealthiest to pay a penny more, <coughs> so every spending commitment they make has to be met by deeper and deeper cuts elsewhere. So, George Osborne, Jeremy Hunt, where will the axe fall? Soldiers? Schools, social workers, the only people the Tories have said they will protect are their friends in big business and in big houses. The Conservatives are trying to pull the wool over your eyes by not telling you how they will give the NHS the resources it needs. It's no good to say you, you recognise Simon Stevens' analysis and that you'll find the money, but give no detail whatsoever of how you'll pay for it. And it's no good, as Labour do, to just say you love the NHS, but offer no commitment to find the money it so badly needs. 
It is the Liberal Democrats who secured nearly £2 billion for the NHS in the autumn statement, and that must continue. It is the Liberal Democrats who secured a further £250 million in the budget, which we want to raise to £1 billion next year and every year, paid for by closing tax loopholes that only benefit the very wealthy. And it is only the Liberal Democrats who will make sure spending on the NHS rises with the economy later in the Parliament to ensure it gets to the extra £8 billion a year it needs by 2020. So, Ed Miliband, David Cameron, it's time to come clean. Will you or will you not give the NHS the £8 billion a year by 2020 that it needs and tell us how you plan to fund it. The Liberal Democrats have. If you care about the NH NHS as much as you claim to, you should too. Because of our plan to raise the money the NHS needs, we can commit to improving mental health services too. At the core of what Liberal Democrats believe is the idea that no matter who you are, where you're from, and whatever your circumstances, you should not be denied the opportunity to fulfil your potential. Yet in Britain today, millions of people are denied the opportunity to, to get on and live happy, fulfilling lives because they live with mental health issues. That might be you. If not, the chances are it will be someone in your family or one of your friends or one of your neighbours. One in four people in our country will experience mental health problems at some point in their lives. Think about that for a moment. One in every four people in this room. One in every four people you work with. One in every four people you pass in the street. In every classroom in Britain, there are on average three children who will have a mental health problem. Today, right here in Britain in 2015. And thousands of them will get no treatment and no support. What a tragedy. What a waste. For decades, mental health services have been neglected by successive governments, the poor relation to physical health problems. In government, the Liberal Democrats have slowly started to undo that damage. Equality for mental health treatment enshrined in law for the first time. The first ever waiting time standards. And hundreds of millions of pounds for talking therapies and services for young people with eating disorders. I set up the first ever cross-government mental health task force to make sure every department is working to tackle mental health issues from the justice system to schools and sport to the armed forces. In the coalition government's final budget, I secured more than a billion pounds to revolutionise services for children and young people, alongside the first ever waiting time standards and a plan to roll out talking therapies across England. It's a plan to give the NHS the resources it needs to treat more than 100,000 children and young people by 2020. Every single one of those children is a life we can change for the better. But we cannot and must not rest there. Equality for people with mental health issues is a liberal mission. And that's why I can announce today that the Liberal Democrats will invest more than £3 billion in mental health services in the next Parliament. That means thousands more people will get access to talking therapies for anxiety and depression. It means waiting time standards for crisis care and for conditions like bipolar disorder. And it means an extra £250 million for pregnant women and mums suffering from depression. We will continue to put mental health front and centre of the political debate. And that's why I'm immensely proud that we are the first party to put equality for people with mental health problems on the front page of our manifesto. Liberal Democrats understand the value of our world-class public services. We won't risk them with deep and unnecessary cuts as the Conservatives will. And we won't jeopardise them by risking our economic recovery with a return to reckless borrowing as Labour will. Only the Liberal Democrats can keep Britain on track and provide both a stronger economy and strong public services. Thank you very much for listening to Norman and myself. And questions, over to you. Who wants to ask the first question? Yep. 
Thanks very much. Um, Andy Bell, 5 News. Can you just clarify exactly how you're going to fund this, both the commitment to the Stevens uh, sure. funding and, I presume, the extra three billion that you've just announced today? No, the, three, the three and a bit billion is part of the overall expanded budget on the NHS. So that's within the eight billion? Yeah, well, the, the, the eight billion, of course, is on top of the however many tens of billions one spends on the, on, the, on the NHS. The eight billion, to be very precise, is the amount that Simon Stevens has estimated is, ne is necessary in upfront support from the government by the last year of the next parliament, uh, in addition to um, about £22 billion, which he thinks can be uh, secured through savings and efficiency savings in the, in the NHS. So he has identified a £30 billion um, shortfall, if you like, and he says the bulk of that can be made up through efficiency savings of, what, 2-3% per year, which is pretty steep uh, for the NHS, and the £8 billion pounds is the amount that he says simply can't be achieved through internal recycled savings within the NHS. It needs to be provided for um, from the government. And the way that we arrive at that figure are the following steps. I mean, firstly, the £2 billion pounds that we have put into uh, the NHS, the autumn statement, is what they call in the jargon baseline. So it's a, it's a sort of permanent additional increase um, in the amount of uh, money going into the uh, NHS. We have then said that we will provide an extra a billion pounds in 2016, 2017, 18 into the NHS, and that will be uh, uh, paid for in part, again, by including the 250 million pounds a year that we just announced, or I announced two weeks ago, in the budget for uh, mental health, but other measures as well. For instance, um, uh, closing some of the reliefs on capital gains tax, which raises around £700 million, uh, and ending the, uh, the, the Conservative Shares for Rights scheme, which raises around £200 million. And then the final step, so that's how you fund the additional billion, on top of the £2 billion we put in the autumn statement and the £250 million we've just announced in the budget, and then to get to the £8 billion is after the structural deficit is dealt with in our plans in the financial year 2017-2018, we will link expenditure on the NHS with the predicted growth rate of the economy, as predicted by the OBR, and that allows you to arrive at that eight billion pound, uh, at that eight billion pound figure. And just be, to be clear, the investment in mental health is the investment over the next Parliament. The eight billion is the annual amount yep. extra that Simon Stevens uh, estimates is necessary, together with uh, the efficiency savings that he's referred to. Ellen Nagania, BBC News. Um, first of all, what demands would you make on the Tories to agree to a referendum on the EU? Shall I go on to do my second? Just waiting for both, because I'm going to give you a very short And um, does Cameron need to come clean on benefit cuts, and don't you need to come clean on exactly where all your tax rises will fall? So, uh, but on, on the first, I, I, I think I've sort of said my piece. You know our position on Europe, which is that, A, of course, we're committed to our continued membership of the European Union, and secondly, we've set out and indeed legislated on the circumstances in which we think a referendum should take place. The Conservatives, I'm not, I mean, I'm constantly asked about other parties' views about Europe. You've got to ask the Conservatives. They, 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 they keep chopping and changing their views on Europe. In the time I've been in government with the Conservatives, we started off with a joint approach, which was the Liberal Democrat approach, which is that you hold a referendum when new powers are transferred to the European Union. In fact, they believed in it with such fervour that we even legislated on it. And you can read stirring, I mean truly stirring speeches uh, by both David Cameron and William Hague in the House of Commons just three or four years ago saying how the circumstances in which a referendum uh, uh, should take place should not be set uh, arbitrarily. Uh, uh, there, should, there shouldn't be an arbitrary date. There should be a trigger, in which there indeed now is in law, that a referendum should take place when new powers are given up to the European Union. They then, of course, changed their mind again. They then floated one arbitrary date. I now read they might bring forward that date. Then one day they say they would, might campaign to leave if they don't get what they want, but they won't say what they want. Then they say, oh, actually, no, even if they don't get what they want, they might stay. I, honestly, I, I, my, the head, my head is spinning about what the Conservative position is. Ours has remained consistent throughout. And then the British people will need to decide on May the 7th on that and so many other contrasting policies. On the latter point, yes, of course, I, I accept that, as, as you know, we have identified, um, uh, to be very precise, £27 billion in additional fiscal consolidation that is necessary in order to deal with what is called the structural deficit. That's the bit of the black hole 
that is, if you like, immune to uh, being sold through growth. Um, and we have said that uh, around £6 billion of that will come from tax increases. Around £6 billion of that will come uh, through um, uh, tax, further uh, measures on tax avoidance and tax evasion. Around £12 billion will come from further savings in Whitehall expenditure. And around £3.5 billion will come from further welfare savings. And I accept at the time that we, uh, we, we publish our manifesto, some of the tax measures that you know about, I've, I've talked about some others today, but uh, a banded high-value um, uh, levy, um, uh, aligning dividend tax and income tax for higher and additional rate taxpayers and ending the Conservatives' uh, unmarried, ta tax, uh, unmarried couple tax penalty and so on. Those are, those are some of the measures that you know about. Um, and I, I accept that your challenge that we should show you how that six, £6 billion figure is arrived at in those additional, additional taxes. But I think we've already actually provided far more detail than any other party already in this very early stages of this election campaign, both about how we uh, fund the NHS to the tune of an additional £8 billion by the end of the next Parliament, um, but also how we uh, divvy up, if you like, the, 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 that total £27 billion figure that we judge necessary in order for the books to be balanced. Andrew. Will the voter, sorry, just very briefly, will the voters know before they go to the ballot box? Know what? Those further details. Will on the tax, yeah, yeah no, I think on, on, on taxes we will, be, we will be pretty specific. Yeah. Thank you. But you haven't provided any detail on how you'll get the £8 billion for the NHS. You've just said it will come for economic growth. Well, by 2017 18, we'll be into eight years into the business cycle upswing, and it could well end. How will you fund it if there's no economic growth after that? Oh, no, look, of course I accept you, you can only work in any, from any parliament to the next when you, when you talk about public spending. You can, only, you can only operate on, you have to operate on certain assumptions. Of course you do. That's what the OBR does, that's what any economist does, that's what any, any analyst of the British economy does. You can't, you can't <laughs> since I can't tell you precisely what the future is going to happen, I can tell you that we base our plans on the predictions that we're given independently by the Office of Budget Responsibility. And it's not unreasonable for us to say, firstly, we will continue to include in the increases that we've already announced, not least in the autumn statement last year and the budget this year. Secondly, to specify some tax changes which will generate additional, uh, additional revenue. And thirdly, to make an, uh, make an assumption, which is a perfectly legitimate, it's not an unreasonable assumption at all, Andrew, to say once you've dealt with a structural deficit, you relink the uh, expenditure on public services in line with the overall growth of the economy. What do you do if there's no growth? Well, look, what do I do if the world comes to an end next Tuesday? I mean, you can't... You can't oh, it's more likely you'll have no growth in the world coming to an end. Uh, well, I, 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 I personally think as long as we stay the course and don't lurch to the right or the left, I accept the greatest threat to, Brit to ongoing growth in the British economy is that we don't continue the balanced approach to fiscal consolidation and maintain the stability which has led to far greater growth than many people predicted. I don't know whether you did it, but a lot of people predicted five years ago we wouldn't have more people in employment than ever before. A lot of people predicted we would never possibly remotely ever be the, large, the, the fastest growing economy in the, in the developed world. So I think I'm entitled to say, firstly, look at our record over the last half a decade, which is one of growth, and in fact growth far in excess of what many people predicted. And secondly, it is not unreasonable for any party, when trying to plot the future, to take the growth rates, which are the assumptions made by the Independent Office for Budget Responsibility. The big difference for, for, for economists like you is that what we're saying is that once the structural deficit is dealt with in 1718, we would then immediately put spending on public services back on a flight path, relinking it to growth in the economy. You legitimately say, well, yeah, but you can't guarantee a particular growth. Of course, I can't guarantee a particular growth rate. I can tell you our manifesto is based on rational and independently held predictions about what the growth rate will be in the latter half of that parliament. Chris. Thank you. Good morning, Chris Hipp from ITV News. Um, 
you're ahead of the other parties on the issue of mental health. You're the only party, as you say, that's committed to find the eight billion at the bottom of NHS England. So why we're not um, racing ahead in the polls? That well, is, no, I suppose my question is, um, why is it by a country mile voters trust Labour on the NHS? And do you think that people just stop listening to what the Liberal De Democrats <laughs> pledged during an election campaign? And we can discuss why. <coughs> um, also, Thursday is the only TV debate of this campaign. Last time you were in an ITV studio standing in a podium, everyone said afterwards, I agree with Nick. What do you think they'll be saying <laughs> after the debate on Thursday? So, uh, if I can't predict precisely the, 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 the growth rates and the way that Andrew's asked, I, can't, I certainly can't predict people's reactions uh, after a television debate on, on Thursday. Of course, it'll be quite different. Uh, it'll be quite, certainly quite different from my point of view, for the, for the obvious reason that in the last, uh, the last te television debates, the three of us, this time there'll be seven, uh, and last time I hadn't been in government, uh, and I, in a sense I was introducing myself to the British public for the first time. This time I'm, I'm a much more familiar proposition to many, uh, many viewers. Um, so we'll see, but I, I think I'll be, I'll be the only person standing up on that podium on Thursday, standing up for a balanced centre-ground approach to finishing the job of balancing the books and finishing it fairly. I mean, you'll, got, you'll have both... Ed Miliband and David Cameron with their increasingly implausible uh, proposals to either cut too much or borrow too much, and then a range of other politicians who will either want to only govern for a part of the country or for very sort of specific single issues. I think what people long for are politicians and political parties that will put the national interest first, which of course is what we've done over the last five years, notwithstanding the impact on our short-term political popularity, and that we will govern for the whole of the country, not just for one section or one part of the United Kingdom. Um, on, uh, on your first point, I think that... Um, I hope that even our most ferocious critics would accept that what Norman and I have done over the last five years, and what I've done from the moment I became leader of the Liberal Democrats seven or eight, or seven or eight years ago, is to is to remorselessly campaign in favour of an improvement in mental health services. It was one of the first things I raised uh, in one of the first Prime Minister's questions I did after I became leader of the Liberal Democrats. I remember at the time the sort of eyebrow-raising cynicism of the Westminster Village that I should pick what was deemed then to be a rather sort of eccentric choice. People didn't talk about mental health in, uh, in the Westminster Village, and I'm delighted that now people do on, on a much greater scale. We've, since then, we've had parliamentary debates, We've had campaigners like Alistair Campbell and, and Stephen Fry talk about it much more openly. But most importantly of all, Norman and I have bit by bit started, and I can only stress that it's started, because this is a long journey. We're not going to do this overnight. We're having to overcome generations, decades of, in effect, institutionalised discrimination against mental health in the NHS. But we have started to turn the tide. New access and waiting time standards are coming to effect this week. For the first time ever from this week, if you suffer from depression, you will, the majority of people who have depression, will be seen within six weeks. If you have an episode of psychosis, you'll be seen just as quickly as if you were first, if you're, if you're suspected of having cancer, you'll be seen in two weeks, uh, in, within two weeks. That's never happened before. £400 million into talking therapies, £150 million into helping particularly young teenagers with eating disorders, and then some of the additional announcements we've made today. So... The answer to your question is, why should anyone believe us? Is because we've done, not just talked about it, we've done a lot to change the NHS and put uh, mental health on the same footing as physical health. So judge us by our actions as well as our words. And, I th and if you were to do that, I hope you would judge us kindly on this and indeed on many other issues. Uh, Joey. Thank you, Joey Jones. I was interested in your uh, talking about yourself as a much more familiar proposition, an implicit recognition of what uh, familiarity tends to breed among the uh, British people. Um, I wanted to ask you about a growing tendency, it seems, to have a pop at Tim Farron within the party. Uh, senior figures <coughs> have uh, said that he lacks judgment, that he lacks credibility. As party leader, how do you feel about those sorts of personal disputes playing out in public? I don't like them. I'm a great fan of Tim. Uh, Tim and I are old friends. He's a very valued colleague. I think he's an outstanding um, foreign affairs spokesperson. I have absolutely no time for kind of personal uh, bickering uh, within my team, and, I, and, I, I, um, and it's certainly not done in my name or on my behalf. Tim is, a, is, is, in my view, one of the most talented political campaigners in this country. Uh, he has an ability to speak to people 
in a very kind of plain, common sense way. He's, he's got a great gift to simplify complex issues and make them accessible to people. And I'm absolutely delighted that he is one of, um, one of our heaviest hitters in this, uh, in this election campaign. Thank you, uh, Ben Glaze, Daily Mirror. Um, given that all the polls are pointing to a hung parliament and the best you can reasonably hope for is to prop up either Tories or Labour, don't voters deserve to know what a red line policy is for you before they cast their vote? Yeah, I think they're entitled to know absolutely what our priorities are. So uh, if you look at the, um, I'm sure you have it on your bedside table, your well-thumbed copy of the 2010 Liberal Democrat Manifesto. You have that, right? <laughs> I can't believe it. Um, if you did, you would find that on the front page of the manifesto, you can have your, the, the, on the front page of the manifesto, you'll find four priorities. Uh, firstly, uh, lifting lots of people on low pay out of paying any income tax by raising the point at which you pay income tax to £10,000. Not only have we delivered that, we've over-delivered on it, because as of uh, next, uh, next week, uh, actually the income tax personal allowance, because of us, will be raised to £10,600 taking over 3 million people on low pay out of paying any income tax at all. Secondly, our priority was to deliver a £2.5 billion pupil premium. That's been now delivered in full to uh, hundreds of thousands of kids from disadvantaged uh, families across the country. Thirdly, we said we would do our bit to uh, stabilise the banks and repair the economy. I think we've done well on that front. And fourthly, we said we would push for political reform. We may not have succeeded in persuading everybody of our vision of political reform, but I don't think we can be faulted for pushing for it. And we will take exactly the same... Now, of course, before you mention it, I, of course, am acutely aware there was a policy on page 36, or whatever it was, on higher education, which we couldn't, uh, which we couldn't deliver. Um, and I accept some people will remind me more of the one policy we couldn't deliver rather than the hundreds we have been able to deliver. But I think a fair judgment of our record will show that for a party that has 8% of MPs in Westminster, it is remarkable how much of our manifesto, in fact, more of our manifesto was reflect, reflected in the coalition agreement than the Conservative Party's manifesto. And so we will take an identical approach this time. Look at the front page uh, of our manifesto if you want a clue about what our priorities are, if you want a clue about the kind of issues we really will dig our heels in on, which we really will sort of die in the trenches for. And what you will see on the front page of the manifesto is firstly a commitment to balance the books, because that needs to be done, but balance them fairly. Secondly, to continue to give people on low and middle incomes further tax cuts by raising the income tax personal allowance to £12,500. Thirdly, the subject of our, uh, our discussions today uh, committing to give the NHS the resources that, that it needs and giving uh, mental health uh, equality of esteem uh, in the NHS alongside uh, physical health. Uh, fourthly, to properly protect expenditure on education from cradle to college, from, from nursery to 19. Uh, because of my insistence, we protected spending going into the school system. But I think we need to go further than that in the next Parliament. And then fifth and finally, to uh, protect the environment. That was the subject of our hedgehog visit yesterday. Uh, to protect the environment and ensure that we uh, give people access to, to, to green spaces uh, and protect the cleanliness of our air and our water uh, in, our, in our country going, going forward. So what you've got on that front page is a commitment to a stronger economy, balancing the books, giving people tax cuts, and a fair and green society in education, in health, and in, uh, and in the environment. And those are the priorities which we will, uh, we will do our utmost to, uh, to put into practice. Thank you. Joe Watts, Evening Standard. You said judge you by your actions, but figures from the Department of Health last week showed that the number of people with psychiatric problems waiting in A&E departments has increased by 50% since you came to power. The number of young people has doubled. So judging you on your actions, do you accept that that's a failure of coalition health policy? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, the, uh, I had this exchange with uh, Andrew <clears throat> uh, Sunday before last, um, <coughs> the way the system works uh, disadvantages mental health and that's what I've been seeking with uh, Nick's uh, very strong support to overcome. So let me just explain. Uh, in the last Parliament, uh, the Labour government introduced waiting time standards uh, and they were right to do so, uh, but they left out mental health and they introduced a payment system in, in the NHS which in effect uh, incentivizes activity in acute hospitals. It advantages physical health again as against mental health. 
And it's as sure as night follows day uh, that that's where the money will go. Uh, it's, it, the, the system is so completely unbalanced. And that's why it's been essential uh, to introduce waiting time standards so that people suffering from mental ill health have exactly the same uh, right to timely access as anyone with a physical health problem. You don't achieve this overnight. Uh, the way the system works, uh, and it's a labyrinthine system, the NHS, it's devolved to local areas, so every local area makes its own decisions about spending. But, so, but when a clinical commission group is faced by very politically powerful access standards in physical health and nothing in mental health, it absolutely drives where the money's going. And I think now we've laid the foundations uh, to achieve genuine equality. And, uh, I mean, just ask people in the mental health world, the leaders in the mental health world, Paul Farmer from Mind, uh, the Royal College of Psychiatrists, uh, Young Minds, uh, and many leaders of mental health trusts about the agenda that uh, I've pursued mm. in the department with Nick's support. There is overwhelming support for it. Uh, we're not there yet, uh, and we're dealing with a system that disadvantages, as I say, mental health, but I think now we've laid the foundations to achieve that equality. Can I just underline something, but not least it's uh, one of uh, Norman's many achievements in this field. It's a rather techie thing, but it's actually, for those who are interested in this, in my view, it's probably the most significant change we've introduced of all. Until recently, uh, mental health trusts would receive uh, uh, funding in, in, in the form of block grant. Other trusts within the NHS family, acute trusts, basically receive funding, it's complicated, but in essence they receive funding through a kind of per patient or per result, per output basis. So there's a link between how much money uh, you know, a hospital trust will receive and in effect the, the, how well and the number of people they care for. For mental health trusts that's never been the case, it's just been a block, so it's a lump of money. What that has meant is that every time any savings have had to be made by NHS managers, the first thing they've done is to sort of salami slice and shave off money from that block grant to mental health exactly trusts. Right. So yeah. every time the kind of financial plan, you know, financial annual planning has gone round, um, it's the NHS trusts which repeatedly, if sometimes sort of quite imperceptibly, have suffered. And we are changing that, and Norman is changing that, by introducing, in effect, the same funding formula for mental health trusts as exist uh, for trusts in the rest of the NHS. And my judgment is that will probably make the biggest difference of all of putting NHS funding for mental health on a fairer and more sustainable and more equal basis. Unless anyone else has any questions. Thank you very much for coming so early. Thank you very much. Thank you.